Thank you for that uh, kind introduction and uh, greetings to several of you in the audience whom I uh, know in the uh, practicing community here of uh, ophthalmology in Washington. <coughs> it's actually a very vigorous and vital dynamic uh, practice of uh, eye and vision care. I'd like to uh, spend a few moments this morning talking about ophthalmic genetics and actually uh, what uh, is now happening in uh, the application of that to care. Let's see if this works. There it goes. Uh, some presentation objectives. I will uh, briefly review uh, some of the history of uh, where uh, genetics has come from historically. And uh, you will, by the end of this, uh, be uh, seeing a number of uh, uh, ophthalmic photos of uh, various eye diseases, the phenotypes. And then to consider where uh, ophthalmology uh, is going to be incorporating gene discovery uh, in therapeutics. Eye disease, in a big hospital like this at Suburban, uh, may not seem to have center stage, but in fact, uh, eye disorders collectively uh, rank in the top 10 of the uh, maladies that affect us as humans, according to uh, WHO just a few years ago. Obviously, we uh, see eyes all the time. I'm looking at a lot of eyes looking at me. And uh, you see yourself in the uh, mirror in the morning. And when you're looking at the eye, you're looking at the uh, external anterior segment, the eyelids, pupil, sclera, iris. Uh, but uh, hidden at the back, inside, uh, are some vital elements of vision. The neural retinal tissue, the red lining uh, here at the back. Red because of the uh, molecule that is light sensitive, uh, rhodopsin. Uh, at the center of the action, the macula, and you're looking at the slide with your macula, it's the fine focus center of vision. There are several major diseases. Uh, here uh, we see four, three of the four uh, major diseases of the eye, cataract. A lot of cataract uh, surgeries are gonna be done uh, in the Bethesda and Washington community today. Uh, and glaucoma, glaucoma straddles the front of the eye. Glaucoma straddles the front of the eye uh, where uh, pressure can build up because of an outflow obstruction of fluid and that pressure for reasons that are rather indecipherable uh, still at the moment, uh, ultimately uh, affects the optic nerve which contains the axons of the 100 million rod and cone photoreceptors uh, in the retina. Uh, and then macular degeneration, which is uh, the scourge of uh, vision. What is not uh, shown here uh, is diabetic retinopathy. Uh, the effect of diabetes on the major blood vessels that line the back of the eye. But that's the way we look at the eye when I was a resident 30-some uh, years ago. Now we look at the eye as tissues and cells. Uh, all of these cells, the light-sensitive rod and cone photoreceptors, the rods containing that rhodopsin that imparts the reddish color to the retina, uh, and the cones, which come in three flavors, red, green, and blue, and give us the uh, full uh, spectrum, uh, chromatic spectrum of vision that we all uh, enjoy. Now, medicine is moving to cells. These cells have obviously been there a long time in the textbooks, but now we're actually dealing with these uh, on a uh, rather medically personal level. And I'm gonna tell you some stories about rod and cone photoreceptors. But back on the thread of genetics in general uh, in eye disease, here are six photographs. These are the kinds of uh, patients who will be seen in the Washington community today. Individuals with cataract, this is a particular special cataract. You can see these white punctate dots, the cerulean uh, cataract. Uh, this young uh, child with uh, the one eye is looking right straight at you, but with the other eye uh, uh, is uh, rather askew, strabismus, muscle surgery, pediatric ophthalmology. Uh, the uh, front here, the iris uh, looks good until uh, you can see that uh, it's not attached at the base. It's, there's a dehiscence, an iris coloboma, a developmental issue. 
And at the bottom, uh, three views of the back of the eye. Age-related macular degeneration, a sheet, a sheet of uh, blood on the back of the eye, uh, through which vision is going to be distorted. And when this blood consolidates and uh, tears up the neural retinal tissue, uh, obviously the vision is going to be uh, impaired significantly. Or glaucoma, the enlarged yellowish center missing the axons because of elevated pressure in the eye. And macular degeneration of the Stargardt flavor, Dr. Stargardt, German, two centuries ago. Uh, an overt genetic problem of vision. But in fact, all of these uh, have uh, a genetic issue going on. So the public health impact of all of this uh, vision impairment is considerable. Uh, tens of millions of uh, of our fellow citizens suffer visual impairment uh, due to diseases that have either a direct genetic basis or uh, result uh, in part from genetic risk. And as we have birthdays every year, uh, the uh, incidence of age-related eye diseases uh, is increasing uh, at an obviously large cost uh, to us as individuals and to society. So while eye care is well advanced, in fact, we need to have more effective therapies. Let me uh, just uh, tell you how I'm going to be using uh, words today. Genes, genetics, genomics, and medicine. Uh, they flow together. Genes, the biologic code. Genetics, the play out of those genes, let's say, uh, in families, inheritance in families, and ultimately affecting society. Genomics how the gene product, the product that the gene makes, uh, affects cells and uh, ultimately what the mechanisms of cell processes are and how that plays out in disease and medicine, the treatment of disease. That's what we and you will be doing here uh, today at, at Suburban. And what we have seen is that we started with genes and we're now squarely in the camp of medicine. But let's roll the uh, clock back two and a half millennia. Hippocrates, blue eyes are inherited. Now that's an interesting uh, idea. Uh, or uh, speaking in Greek, so I'm translating, uh, squinty-eyed children have squinty-eyed parents. When a nearsighted person squints through narrowed eyelids, you perceive a little bit better. And if you look at the kids who are nearsighted, uh, you will find that quite frequently the parents were nearsighted. Or Aristotle, 50 years later, uh, further described myopia, and he recognized that blindness can be transmitted between parent and child. And uh, that was a, an idea picked up uh, later on by Plutarchus, speaking of the biblical uh, Isaac and Jacob, both, both of whom had older age vision loss. Uh, and he had the concept of hereditary old age blindness. It was that macular degeneration. Now speeding up the clock and going back to uh, 1770, Lorton Dalton recognized that color deficiency uh, runs in families uh, and it is us poor feeble men who suffer it as opposed to women. That's because the color genes are on the X chromosome and men have only one, whereas women have two uh, X uh, chromosomes. And when the men have the color deficiency on one, there's nothing to mask it, whereas the women have a second uh, copy uh, that uh, uh, usually has a normal uh, uh, color gene on it. And then a century later, uh, Horner recognized that Quite frequently, men who were colorblind had uncles, mothers, brothers, uh, who were colorblind, uh, speaking of X chromosome inheritance. Uh, and uh, then going a century further, uh, just a few decades ago, Jeremy Nathans cloned one of the genes that imparts uh, light sensitivity uh, and ultimately color vision 
uh, not with rhodopsin, but with the uh, color uh, opsin genes, rhodopsin and the color opsins. So if we look at that year, 1983, when rhodopsin was cloned, there were very few genes that uh, were captured. Uh, but uh, across the three, year, uh, three decade span, the vision community has been extraordinarily vigorous in identifying genes related to eye disease. And now there are some 600 genes that are known, 200 that affect the retina, uh, nearly uh, 200, 150, 200 that are affecting the lens and the cornea at the front of the eye. The eye uh, turns out to be, unfortunately, very rich <coughs> in monogenic traits in which a single gene causes a vision problem. In fact, still about 20% of the identified human disease genes involve the eye and vision. So when we have all of these hundreds and hundreds of genes, what difference does it make? Well, we, we, medicine, science, vision, research, we uh, are now imparting on the new frontier uh, of addressing these problems at the gene level. In a moment, I'll tell you about RP65, a molecule that causes LCA, labor congenital amaurosis, but let me defer that for a moment. In this case, however, there is a defective gene, actually both copies, both alleles of the gene are defective. Uh, and by providing an external normal copy, uh, one can restore the cellular function that depends on RP65. Or in the case of parent to child direct transmission, a dominant transmission, uh, one may, in fact in animals you can, but in humans may be able to suppress that one copy that's defective and allow the second normal copy to, uh, to function throughout life and uh, retain vision. So you'd have to suppress the mutant gene or repair it or just go around the whole system, don't worry about the gene, but deliver some other product uh, that is therapeutic. Let me turn back to this RPE65 for a moment. The story starts in 1869 when Dr. Uh, Theodore Labor uh, saw several children uh, who were blind. They were born blind, severe vision loss. They had bobbing eyes, nystagmus movements, a sign of congenital, severely impaired vision. Uh, and uh, a century later, when the electroretinogram was invented or identified, used, that the responses were found to be non-detectable. The electroretinogram is similar to the electrocardiogram, but in this case it's for the retina, the neural tissue in the eye. Uh, and that tissue was not functioning. These are pictures that I was taught when I was a resident 30 years ago. You look into the eye and sometimes you see nearly nothing, but the child's not seeing. Other times you look in and you see darker spots of injury pigment from injury to cells in the eye. Uh, or you see a dissolution, a breaking up uh, of the neural retinal tissue. So this is LCA, labor congenital amaurosis, Dr. Theodore Labor's congenital blindness, LCA. This is LCA as I was taught it in the pre-molecular era. This is now LCA, 19 genes and counting. These genes are functioning at the level of the rod and the cone photoreceptors and the supporting tissue called the retinal pigment epithelium. And uh, these 19 genes, in fact, are playing right here. And the one that I'm going to focus on, RP65, is involved in the vitamin A cycle. Eat your carrots. Grandma was right. If you don't eat enough carrots, you're going to have vision problems because you need vitamin A. And in fact, there are enzymes specifically at the back of the eye that process dietary vitamin A and make it available in the proper mole uh, uh, molecular configuration to function for vision. So let's return to, to RP65, the molecule, and 
ago, about a decade and a half ago, Mike Redmond, working just across the street in a laboratory in the uh, National Eye Institute, was looking at the genes that are abundant, or actually the proteins that are abundant in the retinal pigment epithelium, RPE, and there was one with a molecular weight of 65, so it gets the name RPE 65 protein. He cloned the gene for it, and everybody admired his technical prowess. He's got a new gene. What does it do? Nobody knew. Five years later, Mike knocked out the gene in a mouse, and the mouse was blind. So we know that uh, RP65 is critical for vision. Rather crude way of finding out, but very effective. At the same time, in uh, Australia, uh, humans were found by a geneticist. Humans were found to have mutations in the RP65 gene, and they were blind. In fact, they had LCA, labor congenital blindness. And then the story moved to Sweden, where a dog was found. The Swedish Briard dog was found to have mutations in this gene. Uh, and then the story uh, speeded up quite a bit. Here is one of the dogs, a Swedish Briard dog. Actually, that's not, I'm told, a Swedish Briard dog, but the gene was put into the dog so that this dog uh, did crossbred, etc. cetera. Uh, but this dog was blind from RP65. And then, within a matter of 1998 to 2001, just in the space of a couple of years, gene therapy was done to put the normal RP65 gene into this dog, and uh, a couple of weeks later, you could play Frisbee with you. Obviously, great story to take down to Congress. <laughs> Everyone loves dogs. Everyone loves genetic stories. So uh, he is our uh, best ambassador for vision. Um, literally, uh, Senator Harkin has met him, et cetera. Well, looking at the electroretinogram function, the complex slide, but not that uh, difficult. Panel one, two, and three. Middle panel, flat responses. This panel, uh, big uh, waveforms. In a normal, in a normal. Compared to this dog before treatment, no action. This is very dim light and very bright light. A flash of light startles the neurons and gives you these waveforms. And you like big and you don't like flat and the dog is flat. But when you put the gene in, RP65 gene, look what comes back. And that's why the dog can play Frisbee with you. In fact, the dog tells you it's got vision and the electrical function says it has vision. Well, from 2001, it was just a major step, uh, but only a few years before gene therapy was done for kids who had LCA from RP65. Uh, and uh, that was recognized by Science Magazine a year later in 2009 uh, as a seminal event in science and medicine. It was only the runner-up. I don't remember what the winner was, but I think it should have been the winner. Uh, here is Al McGuire, one of the authors on the first report of uh, treating these kids with blindness. And he is uh, treating a young man, injecting the gene into the eye. Let's just look at what that really means to treat an eye genetically. What he is doing uh, here in cartoon is to take a very narrow needle, fine needle, and put it through the eye wall underneath the retina, inject some fluid that contains the vector, make a little bubble, or here another illustration of bubble. Here are the rod and cone photoreceptors. Here's the retinal pigment epithelium where the gene resides. Uh, so he puts the fluid next to those RPE cells, provides the the, uh, the gene, ultimately, uh, and uh, this child uh, is now playing baseball. Well, this is, that was RP65, one example uh, of gene therapy for vision. And there are many others. Stargardt 
macular degeneration. I mentioned that, I showed you a slide right at the outset, uh, Dr. Stargardt. We know the gene, it's ABCA4. And uh, there is a company, Oxford Biomedica, uh, which is quite vigorous uh, in working in gene therapy. In this case, they are using lentivirus because this gene, our ABCA4, is a monster. It's huge. It has nearly 60, 60 exons. It's a big, big gene. It doesn't fit in most delivery vectors. Uh, so you turn to something that can carry a big cargo, the lentivirus. And they have a trial going on, Stargen, uh, just uh, started recently. Here's another one, Usher syndrome. Children born deaf and rapidly going blind, such that by age 20 they really have uh, <coughs> negligible residual vision. Also a big gene. And uh, they have a trial going on for uh, Usher syndrome. Or, and these are direct, these are direct gene therapy, these two. Uh, these two uh, trials. Or, somewhat indirectly, using the same delivery, the, uh, the lentivirus, but delivering therapeutic vectors, uh, therapeutic molecules, endostatin and angi an angiostatin, delivering the gene that makes the protein and the protein rescues the function of macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, causing new blood vessels, neovascularization of the retina. And uh, in aggregate, the vision community uh, is quite vigorous in, in uh, working in the area of gene therapy. Labor congenital amaurosis, RP65 started the ball rolling. Here's Usher syndrome and Stargardt's soluble flit. Uh, many of these uh, currently are being uh, done uh, in, uh, outside the U.S., uh, but we uh, expect that they will be moving here into the States uh, soon. What else do you do with genes? You've got genes. What do you do with them? Well, how about using them for medicine to inform people of their fate? Here is an interesting story that I would commend to you, New York Times, July 9 last summer, and this is for ocular melanoma. You can read it online, Cassandra Canton, age uh, 18, noticed a vision problem, went to her ophthalmologist who said, uh, Cassandra, you've got a problem, you've got a tumor, you've got a cancer in your eye, it's growing, it's, it's broken up the retina, uh, we're going to have to do something. In this case, the doing something literally is to remove the eye, and nucleate the eye. Because you can't contain this cancer, you take it out at the source. Take the eye out, put in a, a prosthetic uh, shell so that uh, cosmetically you and I wouldn't notice, but obviously you're losing an eye, Cassandra. Well, ocular melanoma, melanoma, skin melanoma, it, it's a pigment uh, cell condition. So it is the pigmented uveal tissues of the eye. Here at the front of the eye, uh, the iris has uh, pigmented tissue, and you can see the iris melanoma, kind of fluffy, elevated. It's a growth on the iris. Bad, bad, bad sign. That eye uh, uh, is in uh, 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 serious jeopardy. Or looking at the back of the eye, here is a tumor, a melanoma, a ball of melanoma growing underneath the retina. About 2,000 Americans will be newly diagnosed this year, and half of them are going to die from metastases. But the story becomes extremely interesting for these patients, but also for all of cancer, uh, by the work of an ophthalmologist, Bill Harbour, working at uh, Washington University, St. Louis, uh, who collected these cases and began to do proteomics on them and sorted out the cases as people who didn't die and people who did die, and compared those, and came up with a critical difference. People who died, he found, had mutations, an alteration of the BAP1 gene in 84% of those metastatic tumors. BAP1, breast cancer, BRCA1, associated protein 1. Uh, and his findings suggested that BAP1 suppresses 
metastases, and so if you, it's a negative, double negative statement, if you make mutations in this, you cause metastases. So if we, and this paper published in 2010 was rapidly turned into a medical diagnostics test by Castle Biosciences in 2011, and you can order it here in Suburban. Uh, turning back to uh, Cassandra, the question now is which class is she? Class one, over the span of five and six years, they don't die. And uh, this is a composite of several hundred cases of uh, ocular melanoma. Or uh, is she in class two with a median survival uh, of just over four years? Turns out, read it online, uh, she has class one, she's all set, but the Second part of that same story uh, is another uh, individual uh, who falls in this class. Uh, that is medicine, folks. You can't always fix things, as all of us know, <laughs> but you have to work with patients and give them information that they can act on, and I think this is first-class medicine. Well, what about this rumor that uh, people don't want to know what they've got? Uh, let's uh, stick our heads in the sand. Uh, don't think so. People want to know about the genetics in their family. The, these, I make a joke, are two of my uh, favorite uh, magazines, and in uh, one year, 2007, uh, Science has Human Genetic Variation, Breakthrough of the Year, and Wired Magazine uh, says Your Life Decoded. People are very interested in their genetic status. So how does ophthalmology deal with this? We've got 600 genes to deal with. And, and we're just scratching the surface. How do we deliver on the promise of diagnostics and genetics for people at a time when opportunities are expanding? H how do we handle the large variety of these infrequent monogenic diseases in which one gene is converted into a disease? Several years ago, the Eye Institute initiated a project called iGene because uh, several years ago there were boutique laboratories, research laboratories, that were doing genetics for one or two genes. If you are interested, just uh, go back to your computer and uh, Google iGene, and this will come up so you can get the information yourself and participate if you wish. It's a national network of these boutique laboratories that in aggregate uh, are uh, testing uh, 35 genes, excuse me, about 100 genes for 35 diseases. And the scheme here, this is under the National Eye Institute, so our scheme is, yes, it's important to provide diagnostics to people and genetic information, but it's also critical for research to know the medical characteristics of those people. Uh, this slide breaks out into three parts, the patient and the physician. Part one, sends a sample to coordinating center, and Carrie, I see you sitting there. Carrie, raise your hand. Uh, Carrie is uh, running that right across the street. And the center sends it, distributes a sample to uh, one of many laboratories that are boutique research laboratories at the moment. They've got special expertise in your gene, if that's what you need. The information comes back, goes back to the patient. That's medical care. At the same time, the individual signs a consent right up front that says, anonymize my information, keep it uh, safe, but use it, use it for research so that we can understand what these diseases are and how to proceed. So we've got a, a unified medical care research venture going. We've got, has a registry, consents, contact information, the phenotypes, meaning the medical characteristics, the genotypes, the gene level, uh, and a repository of samples. Uh, it has been well received across the country. Uh, all but five uh, states uh, have participating sites. I keep telling Carrie to uh, take a site visit to Vermont uh, to encourage them. She wants to go to Hawaii and, and Alaska <laughs> instead. Um, and uh, we're enrolling about uh, 1,000 patients a year. I think, Carrie, that's your saturation point. 
a lot of hands-on work, but the importance is to couple what happens in this hospital, the medical venture of patient and physician medicine, to get that information put together with a genotype so that we can move on with understanding the interplay between phenotypes and genotypes. Diagnostics is moving on, as uh, we all know. Now we're at the level of sequencing the entire human genome for individual patients, and particularly with suburban coupled to uh, Johns Hopkins. This is state-of-the-art medical care. It's tricky because the information is so vast, 20,000 genes you're looking at or something, the information is so vast that it becomes an analytics problem and not a cost of sequencing problem. The cost has dropped over the past six, seven years from a million dollars for your genome to a thousand dollars for your genome. So it's not, that's not the cost. The cost is the analytics uh, and the medical information to extract from that. Ophthalmology has been uh, front and center in this. Uh, this is a Page uh, 2010, Science Magazine, affordable exomes fill gap uh, in rare diseases. Yes, a lot of our diseases are rare diseases, whether they're cardiology diseases or ocular diseases. Uh, in this case, uh, what was featured was the Litsky uh, family, uh, Betty and Carlos, four wonderful kids, born with vision, no problem. Unfortunately, three of them are now blind, and despite all of these boutique laboratories envisioned looking for this gene in the Litsky family living in Miami. It was elusive until uh, a group just shotgunned the human genome in this family and came up with a new gene, DHDDS. Uh, DHDDS. Turns out to be an enzyme that puts sugar groups on the rhodopsin molecule clone, and the rhodopsin molecule I mentioned was cloned by Jeremy Nathans in 1983. And without those sugar groups, the rhodopsin molecule, the light sensitive molecule of the eye, doesn't function, and so the kids lose their vision. And uh, now uh, therapy uh, ideas are moving forward uh, in animals for DHDDS. So far, I have spoken only of these single gene causes you the problem diseases. Single gene diseases, monogenic diseases, Mendelian, Gregor Mendel diseases. But there's a whole world of patients seen in this building who have what are called complex genetic diseases. In general, these are the most common that affect us, and they are due to risk factors that ultimately impair, together collectively impair cell function and cause disease to happen. The most common of those blinding conditions for ophthalmology is age-related macular degeneration, AMD. And uh, at the bottom, what was unfolding was a panoply of uh, pictures, a normal fundus, the optic nerve, the blood vessels, the macula, the reddish retinal tissue, and with aging, a number of individuals develop these spots. They're lipid accumulations, they're debris accumulations, they're called drusen. And those drusen predispose, heavily predispose, to one of two things, either atrophy, death of tissue, or hemorrhage. And for either of those, when you have this in the center of your vision, you can't see through it. You are blind legally blind, at least 2,200 uh, from loss of central vision. You've got your peripheral vision, you can get around, but you can't drive, you can't play cards, you can't watch TV, you can't read. Two million Americans are already legally blind from AMD. Many more are at risk, and we're all getting older, so let's get on with the show and do something about it. But this is a complex disease. There's no single gene to be looking for. You've got to look for the risk conveyed by a gene. Uh, and in fact, uh, well, here's, here's just an illustration of cartoon form of the havoc this causes with uh, vision. Um, and then a seminal event happened just a few years ago, 2005, when five groups simultaneously 
uh, identify the CFH gene, complement factor H gene. Just parenthetically, I, I love being part of the vision community. We don't do it one time, we do it five times. <laughs> you, uh, you worried about uh, is this report true or not? Well, this article of this uh, issue of science has three independent groups publishing the same gene, identifying the same gene for AMD. Uh, and I would congratulate Emily Chu sitting here, uh, who with uh, Rick Ferris and John Paul San Giovanni at the I Institute uh, were front and center uh, in uh, the Klein uh, article uh, of CFH gene. So what does this tell us? It's only a gene. Oh, this tells us a lot. <coughs> this is the complement cascade system, the immune system of the body. And within a year, two more complement components, factor B and complement component C2 came on the scene, more risk factors for AMD. This says that AMD as a cousin of other chronic diseases that have a play with the immune system, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cardiovascular disease. Th these are cousin diseases in invoking the surveillance uh, mechanisms of the body. And uh, quite remarkably, if you add up these three genes, 74% of the risk of developing AMD is accounted for. These are heavy, big players. Uh, here is a schematic, simplified schematic, of uh, the complement uh, cascade uh, system. Uh, CFH sitting in the middle uh, uh, plays in all three pathways. Here is C2, here's C7, here's factor B. So uh, uh, AMD uh, is somehow invoking uh, activity of the uh, immune system. And obviously uh, that last slide gives us some therapeutic targets to consider. Well, I'd like to roll the clock back to 2005 for just a minute. Here are the Mendelian single gene monogenic traits. Uh, in 2005, there were 1,700, and at that point, vision ophthalmology had identified about 450 genes that cause vision problems. In other words, the vision community owned, very strong word, don't mean to imply anything, but contributed a quarter of the cloned disease genes. Whereas the complex traits were poking along here, different scale, at fewer than 10. And then AMD came on the scene. It was number eight or nine uh, in diseases for which risk genes had been identified. Rather seminal accomplishment, 2005. Here it is. This was the only gene identified, only disease gene identified in 2005 for common complex disease. By a year later, 12 months later, uh, here's a second macular degeneration gene. And here we have a cardiovascular uh, problem, uh, prolonged QT uh, interval or inflammatory bowel disease. Rare company, 2006. 2007, medicine catches up. 2011, oh my goodness, here's the state of medicine. This is now, uh, what, a year and a half ago? 249, 250 medical traits, common complex diseases, 1,600 genetic studies. The entire genome is populated with knowledge about the diseases you and I see today at Suburban uh, and uh, at NIH. And, but I don't want to imply uh, as uh, some people think I do. I don't want to apply that uh, life is merely genetic. It's bad enough to have the complement factor H gene because that increases your risk of uh, developing AMD fo fourfold over not having it, or sixfold for another uh, AMD locus. But if you smoke, watch out. That fourfold goes to ninefold and this sixfold goes to 22. So life is complicated, but a lot of what we deal with is uh, genetic. So how do we find these genes? The first three kind of dropped in our lap. Uh, total surprise to me, Emily, thank you for pursuing this. 
But how do we find the rest of the genes? The I Institute a few years ago under Heyman Chen uh, organized uh, a, a, a group, a research group, 24 uh, different research groups, uh, and uh, they pooled their cases, several thousand disease cases, uh, and uh, I didn't schedule it this way, but there was news yesterday, yesterday, uh, that this group, their, uh, their paper has just been accepted in Nature Genetics to be coming out soon, which will report a total of uh, 17 loci, 17 genes conveying risk for AMD. That takes concerted action. And it's bad enough to remember all those gene names, but the important thing is those genes begin to cluster. We talked about the cluster in the complement immune system cascade. Some of the genes cluster uh, in lipoprotein pathways, others in matrix pathways, others in angiogenesis signaling pathways. So now we're getting a flavor of <coughs> the complexity of AMD. And uh, the Ion suit is doing the same thing for uh, glaucoma. Glaucoma has been recalcitrant, no real genes. Yes, there are tiger myocillin gene, uh, late, uh, late uh, uh, when was it, 20-some um, years ago. But other than that, uh, genes have not been found. Uh, but getting together a group under auspices of the National Eye Institute, uh, they uh, just last fall published a whole genome scan and there were two loci that popped up. So we hope that genes will be found. But actually the lesson on this is kind of curious. This group met three weeks ago and what they concluded is their clinical input is off base. The genetics is fine, but it's not coming up with things because the clinicians are saying they really don't understand the concept of glaucoma. Now, that's an admission for a clinician, right? But it's an important part of how this field moves forward, to take genetic information or the lack thereof and have it feedback into medicine. So how many genes do we need? Is 17 enough? There's a lot of information that just uh, flashed up here, but uh, let me run this real quickly. If we take those three genes that accounted for about 74% of the risk, the first three major genes, it turns out that um, we classify 74% of the true cases, but uh, we would miss on 31% of the controls. Not bad, two to one. Problem is, many, many more people are in this normal group who will not get AMD. So when you do the multiplication and misclassify a huge population, misclassify it one third of the time, it turns out that in seven of eight people you say are at high risk, you were wrong. Now, that's not a very good test to use. <laughs> so. In fact, you do need a lot of genes, and this is going to be a very complicated process in complex diseases. Maybe that's why they're called complex diseases. I'd like to uh, just wrap this up uh, in uh, a few minutes. What's next? Here are some seminal events in medicine. Polio vaccine. Many in the room are old enough to remember the excitement that this generated. Uh, and then a decade and a half ago, cloning a mammal. Oh my goodness, the world was going to fall apart. Th this was seminal. And a decade ago, uh, the uh, Human Genome Project, uh, Francis and Craig Ventner. Seminal events. I'd like to, and they all made well in time and time, but here's a seminal event for ophthalmology. Published uh, Nature uh, a year and a half ago. This, folks, is a mouse eyeball grown in culture from single mouse embryonic stem cells. This is a seminal event. Yoshiki Sasai did this work. We had him uh, speaking across the street last year. 
He started with uh, mouse embryonic stem cells, and they grew into not a monolayer of cells, but in fact organized a whole organ, the eye. All, all, all that's missing uh, is the lens, and this thing could see, the eye could see, but how do you connect it to the, to the brain? Well, we've got to figure that out. And when that's figured out, we will be able to grow new eyeballs for people. Now, that's a bold idea. A year ago, uh, I took that idea to the National Advisory Eye Council, the oversight body for the NEI, uh, and said, uh, let, let, let's consider being bold. Let's consider being audacious. The Eye Council took that up, uh, and uh, they came up with the, uh, the, the, the term audacious goals challenge. Uh, this was an aspirational slide a year ago, but uh, it's now reality because two weeks from now, a week from Sunday, two weeks from Sunday at the Bolger Center in Potomac, uh, we will have 200 people uh, comprising all of these disciplines together to think about how to stimulate innovative, visionary thinking uh, to take vision forward. So uh, stay tuned, please, because this will be uh, two weeks from now. Obviously, it takes a little time, but I'm pleased, actually, that a mere 12 months after proposing the idea, in fact, we're able to act on it with uh, 200 <coughs> clever, thinking, innovative scientists uh, getting together uh, to envision uh, the opportunities again. We'd like to be at the edge of current technologies, or maybe even beyond where we are, 10 years to make things play out would be our goal, and that's a long time. Uh, I don't want to do science fiction, so let's stay in, in, in the ballpark, uh, but let's actually think about uh, what we can imagine doing. Can we connect an eyeball grown in a, tish, a dish uh, into the brain? I have no idea. But if one could, what would be the implications uh, of that kind of thinking? So, the Eye Institute will invest a significant uh, part of uh, its resource, our resource, your resource, because it's tax dollars, uh, into thinking uh, the next decade and two decades ahead. Well, that's it. I uh, thank you for your interest. And uh, I think that uh, we are moving ahead. And I think all of medicine is just leaping forward now. This started, uh, it, it, one, one measure is a decade ago uh, with Francis uh, and others working on that human genome. It has proven to be seminal for medicine, for research, and now for patient care. Thank you. Are there comments or questions for Dr. Sweeney? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Could you paraphrase it for uh, That's an interesting question. So uh, when you do gene therapy, do you do it one time or does it take repeated uh, dosing? Uh, you can do it one time in most cells, and particularly cells such as the pigment epithelium uh, that don't uh, divide and replicate. Uh, the uh, gene goes in, it snuggles next to the chromosome, the genetic elements that are in the cell naturally, uh, and then acts as though it had been there a long time and it stays there. Uh, that is certainly the case so far for the dogs that were treated, our representative to Congress uh, just died uh, a decade after the therapy and uh, had not lost anything that he had recovered. Uh, so uh, it looks like it's a one-shot deal. And, and actually buried in that is a seminal problem for the pharmaceutical industry. How do you price it? How do you cure somebody? One shot. How do you price that one shot? Is the special place that the central nervous system has as a sanctuary away from some of the immune system help in this matter? Uh, we think so. The neural tissue, the retina tissue at the back of the eye is relatively protected from immune attack, but it's not actually totally isolated. Uh, it is simply, uh, the immune system is slower to act with it, so uh, we're not totally immune, but uh, it does give us a head start. Thank you.
Other comments or questions? The virus is that are used as vectors. Do they cause any problem at all? These uh, lengthy virus or some other viruses? Oh, you, ju you just problem. snuck that in on me. So do the viruses cause a problem? I thought you were first talking about what's used currently, AAV, adeno-associated virus. It seems AAV seems not to cause a problem. Lente is of greater concern. Uh, it's uh, part of the HIV AIDS axis. Uh, and so those Lente viruses are engineered quite specially and specifically to remove elements that might cause cellular proliferation, tumor growth, et cetera. Uh, so far, with the lentiviruses that have been put into the human body, uh, they, therapeutically, uh, they are not causing a problem. I'm sure at some point there will be something that happens, uh, but uh, in general, I think it's a safe uh, statement that prudence, medical prudence, research prudence can overcome the problem. Turning that around, Viruses, the origin of diseases, the viruses? Uh, I'm not a virologist. I would uh, look to Bob Nussenblatt sitting back there quietly, uh, who uh, knows a lot more uh, in answer to your question. Uh, in this case, the viruses that are being used uh, are <laughs> the, uh, uh, the genome of the virus uh, uh, codes for some very specific elements. and. Those elements have been taken out, re-engineered, and put back together, so these viruses uh, are disabled. No, I understand that, but historically. Historically. Do they cause? Well, they can. Be. There are examples of uh, genes in the wrong place, or genes from one organism, one species, in another species, and it is thought that they were deposited by a naturally occurring viral vector. So in fact, uh, viruses uh, genetically can cause mischief. Yes? Yeah. Is the genetic and phenotypic data being made publicly available so that other investigators can use it? Absolutely. That's the point of it. Okay. Uh, I would encourage you to go to iGene yeah. and you can read a little bit about it, but this is a public database, public in the sense that uh, through research permissions uh, one gains access to it. One gains access to uh, uh, securely coded uh, information. Uh, there's no uh, private information, individual information, uh, but one can and research can drill down to that uh, individual level because of the consents that are in place. Uh, so what about commercial gene testing? Specifically, the question is phrased uh, for common complex diseases and for AMD. Uh, again, go to Google, type in AMD gene testing, and I'm sure you'll come up with a bunch of uh, commercial sites. What do you make of it? Talk to Carrie next to you. She'll have the answers. But here's, here's, here's my answer. Uh, I showed you the example of the mischief that is caused by imprecise information. The genetic testing that is being done by these services does not in, knows nothing more than we do, uh, and consequently they are going to be mislabeling a considerable number of individuals who will not be getting AMD, but think they may uh, because the testing is imprecise. So it's a risky area, difficult area. Could you comment on the process of getting this wonderful science out into the hands of practicing clinicians who are out there slugging it out every day? How, how, how is that working in the eye world? Uh, how is it working in the eye world to engage uh, the day to day practitioners? Uh, uh, I am pleased to be an ophthalmologist. Uh, because I think the ophthalmology uh, community is the best. Oh, boy, I shouldn't say that, but it's very good. Uh, and uh, ophthalmologists uh, seem to be curious people, people who are curious, uh, and they are incorporating uh, genetic information as rapidly uh, as all of medicine is. Now, one of our strategies with the iGene genetic testing, in fact, was to engage 
community ophthalmologists and has that map of the United States all coded green except for six uh, states. Uh, the practice community, in fact, is participating in this uh, and uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology meeting every year, like all professional societies, uh, has specific sessions on uh, genetics, testing, and implications for practice. Do you, do you focus on competencies or basic knowledge or both? It seems to me that a um, quick way to get this engaged, doctors understand how to function with this data rather than knowing which exon. That, that, that is a critical, critical uh, issue. And again, I'm going to point to Carrie because she thinks about this as does her compatriot next door, uh, in uh, how does one use genetic information? How do you, con so you're a, a practicing physician, you're, you're seeing a patient with Stargardt, what do you do with the information when it comes back? Uh, it is going to be necessary for all of medicine to be teaching uh, genetics, hardcore genetic knowledge in our medical schools as they are doing. Other comments or questions? Yes. For the single genome patients about 600 you just talked about, how can you, uh, how do you determine the location of the disease? I mean, it, because they involve the whole eyeballs and uh, where the disease is, one spot or where is, or you need to So how do you tailor therapy to the cells and parts of tissues that are in particular need? Well, for the RP65, the congenital blindness, labor congenital blindness, <laughs> RP65 LCA disease, that is an enzyme deficiency in the retinal pigment epithelium. So you put the vector right next to the pigment epithelium. You flow the, the fluid right onto the pigment epithelium in the operating room right here uh, when retinal surgery is done. So you can get the gene in physical proximity to the tissue. Uh, let's say that there's an extraocular muscle problem. Uh, it is easy to put a needle to the muscle, deposit some fluid, and have it suffuse through the muscle fibers. So, uh, in fact, uh, for ophthalmology, uh, for the eye as an organ system, uh, the eye is very amenable uh, to uh, uh, genetic intervention, I would think. Other comments or questions? No, please join me in thanking Dr. Stephen for a wonderful